Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 115, I chat with Michael Fremmer, editor of the new website Analog Planet, about his passion for vinyl. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded June 12, 2012, episode 115 Journey to the Analog Planet. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of hometheater.com. This week's return guest geek is Michael Fremmer, the editor of the new website analogplanet.com, uh, one of the growing family of websites uh, published by the same company that does hometheater.com. And we're here to talk about, what else? Analog audio. Hey, Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be with you. And of course, you have better lighting than I do, and, and you have a cough <laughs> button. But I'll, I'll, I'll persevere anyway. It's you'll you'll muddle through, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, those who are uh, tuned in live at live.twit.tv or uh, uh, logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Michael, and I'll pass along as many as I can. So, Michael, congratulations on the new website, analogplanet.com. Uh, this is uh, all about, well, tell us, tell us what it's all about and how it came about. Well, how it came about, and what it's all about is, uh, you know, originally I, I got to Stereophile in 1995, and I said to the editor, I would like to do uh, a column about uh, vinyl and turntables. And uh, the editor, John Atkinson, said to me, uh, well, okay, but, you know, you're going to be writing yourself out of a job because the records are going to go away in two or three years. And, I and when said, was this? 1995 and then uh -huh. that was a pretty good call in 1995 and i said to him i said uh well you know if that happens uh i'll find another job that i can do because if i can't write about if i can't listen to hi-fi and report what i hear based on records at least for part of the mix then i'll find something else to do because i can't listen to cds i just find them totally uh unacceptable sonically and you know some people think that's really a crazy position and i say you know you, you take people who, who can't eat peanut butter, who die from it, and you take someone who can eat peanut butter, and he goes, look, I'm eating it. What's the matter with you? There's nothing wrong with peanut butter. It's perfectly <laughs> fine to just eat it. But something about uh, digital sound, when it first came out, it, it was so horrible to me. It, it just ruined, not only did it sound bad, it made me feel bad. And if anybody thinks that's some kind of crazy position, I, fine, then go ahead and eat peanut butter if you're allergic to it. But it made me feel bad. On top of sounding bad. So the combination wow. was such. I said to, to John, you know, let me write this column. If, if vinyl goes away in two or three years, I'll change careers. Maybe I'll get a job as a food taster for a GIF or something. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> he said, he said, OK, so I started writing it. And that was and I had my column was called Analog Corner. So now here it is. Uh, what, 20 years later or so. And I've gone from a corner to an entire planet. So <laughs> I think that's a good step in the right direction. I so, should say. Now, tell, tell, tell us uh, if you can in words, which is difficult to do, but you're, me, if anyone can, you can. What it is specifically about CDs that you find um, objectionable? Well, I'll say it's less so now than it was then. But at ah. the beginning, at the beginning, they were taking these wonderful sounding recordings that I knew very well from, you know, playing back a, a good quality LPs properly played back that had uh, three dimensionality and textures and depth and uh, spaciousness, which the CD enthusiasts say is all L minus R distortion. Well, fine. Then what I hear live at Carnegie Hall is L minus R distortion. And <laughs> taking all, all this wonderful music that you could sit in, close your eyes and listen to and just not do anything else, not read a book, not cook, you know, just sit and listen to. And they were turning it into what I describe as the equivalent of what they did on the planet Krypton to uh, criminals. Remember the first movie 
They would oh, squash sure. them into the, between this plate and they'd be like, Ehh! and then they would right. spin them off the space. That's, <laughs> right. I- that's what CDs sound. I wanted to give you a movie. This is, you know, we're, we're talking home theater also. That's what it sounded like to me. It sounded horrible. And my attitude was, okay, it's a new technology. There's going to be a learning curve involved in this. It's not going to be great right away. Eventually, it'll get good. But immediately, it sounds horrible. But what kind of reaction did I hear in the in the press and among even recording issues? This is the greatest thing ever. And so to me, it was like Kevin McCarthy in in, uh, in the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. They're coming. Stop it before it happens. <laughs> a whole, you know, the idea that the entire history of recorded sound would be archived in this horrible flat, dimensionless, grainy, uh, shiny, I mean, sonically shiny, forget about physically shiny, format, plus the packaging. I mean, it was, how could anybody look at a CD and say, oh, I'd rather have that than a record? I mean, you, I, what would you rather have? You know, a, a nice record that you, you can hold in your hand and take out of the jacket and, and look at, or this plastic I don't even have one around here because I try, try not to keep them around. But, you know, the jewel case. They had to call it a jewel case because what it really was was a plastic box of crap. So they had to call it a jewel case. <laughs> the whole thing bothered me right from the beginning. And I, and I, you know, and so n- now at this point in time, CDs have gotten better. But they're still, to me, uh, a, a less than ideal format. And now you can download high-resolution files and here are 9624 files. And that sounds closer to what analog sounds like than does a CD. Even the best CDs just still have a glazed, flat quality, even though I get into arguments with people online who still say CDs are transparent to the source. But I think they're in a minority at this point. They're like the cranks. Hmm. There's even a question uh, that said, high-resolution digital will be bad for music. You can go online, you can find this guy. He's convinced that a higher resolution is bad. It's like saying... 480i NTSC television is good enough. If you make it any better, it's going to make TV and movies worse. That's the same. (laughs) Even if you don't think it makes it sound better, why would you not want a a greater cushion, a greater margin of error so that you'd have higher resolution sound? You know, even if more dynamic range, more frequency response, the whole thing. Your ears can't hear that high. Yeah, but, yeah, but the brick wall filters are, you know, they th- they're not perfect at 20K. They're, they're going to be feedback down into the range you can hear. And you can hear it. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you brought I'm- up so many things already. I, I just want to quickly uh, ask you to, to tip your camera down a little bit. Those of you who are watching the show, um, uh, your camera, I think, has been slightly uh, uh, moving downward uh, or upward, I should say. Jumpy? You mean I'm moving and jumpy? Shocking. There you go. There you go. That's Is that better? better. Yeah. You could even be a little bit more. Higher. Yeah. Uh, pointed lower. Pointed lower. Yeah. So your head is higher in the we frame. We don't need to see any of your ceiling. How's that? We'd rather see your face than the ceiling. Don't like yeah, the Yeah, we shirt? don't need to see any of your ceiling. Uh, no, we don't want to see your shirt either. <laughs> your Why? smiling face. It, 33 and a third. Oh, that's good. That's a good that's message. Good. That is the message. That's the message. Why in the world did they choose a, a rotational speed of 33 and a third revolutions per minute? Well, you know, uh, at first, uh, RCA chose 45. And they were, you know, they started releasing uh, multi album sets at 45 RPM with the big hole because 45 sounds better than 33. And then Peter Goldmark at Columbia. Uh, came up with 33. And I'm sure there are certain mathematical reasons why that is, and I probably should know them, but I don't. So I can't yes. really answer. It probably has um, to do with warp wow and and uh, other aspects, other mechanical aspects of of uh, cutting lacquers. But I don't, you know, that's a good question. So you've yeah. embarrassed me with, I'm going away, goodbye. <laughs> no, 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 don't go, don't no, go. Don't worry. Um, yeah, Doctor Doctor T in the chat room says that already some people say that 4K is too much in terms of a vi- a visual resolution, video resolution. Well, um, and there are those who will argue that at least with smaller screen sizes. Right, and isn't that because right now there there isn't any content and there's no way to, re- to to get that kind of quality? What what is it? To your, you're up converting uh, 1080p uh, to yep, yeah to so. 4K for the most part. Yeah, but of course, you know, analog is analog is infinite resolution. It, it, goes, <laughs> it goes down into the noise floor, as far down as the noise floor can go, and it right. goes up into the 50K area. You know, they used to have a 
surround sound on vinyl and it was a it was a high frequency carrier you know that that was up like at 50k so uh you play back a record you have very wide response and it, and they say oh it's limited bandwidth cuz you know there's it's noise but it goes way below 20 hertz into the noise floor and you don't hear the noise. I mean, listen, if I, people say, oh, well, you, you like pops and clicks. If I sat here and listened to pop, you think I like hearing pops and clicks? I don't like it. I don't hear pops and clicks. You clean your records and play them back properly on a good turntable, you really don't hear pops and clicks. Mm. And if you hear a couple of pops and clicks, you know what? You better not go see live classical music because the audience there are elderly people and they go in the winter and all concert long, you're going to hear. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you want to concentrate on? The coughing and the choking? Or people are dying. And, you know, they, they're so old. Some of them are dying and they drag them out during the concert. You don't notice that. You're watching the music. You're enthralled by the music. So when I listen to records, if there's an occasional pop or click, it doesn't bother me. I don't like them. I don't like scratches in records where every time it goes around, you're like, so, you know, when Irving sitting behind me at, at Avery Fisher Hall is tapping his cane in time with the music, I reach back and stop him. I don't want to hear that. Right. But, <laughs> you know, pop or click, you know. Well, in fact, you I'd said like that. You. You go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I want to play you something because you know, since I know a lot of people from a home theater are probably watching this, I yeah. wonder how many of, how many of them realize just how much um, uh, music is uh, lifted by one of your favorite composers, uh, John Williams, and how much of it he actually lifts from, from other people. So, uh, um, boy, I don't know. You you got an example there? Yes, I have an example on my turntable. You know, wow. I could. So I want to play it for you. And this is, um, and, and it's from another film composer. And so um, this is, uh, so I can show this to you. This is a record that Warner Brothers put out in, uh, in the early 60s called The Music of Eric Wolfgang Korngold. You oh, yeah. Really okay. So hey, he did. In the fact, in fact, David Mac D in the chat room says, here comes Korngold. That's right. <laughs> he knew. But I could do it. There's other examples, too, you know. But now I have to reach over. I hope you can still see me. I'm going to I'm going to be uh playing the record here on on this contraption. Okay. <clears throat> now is this your super duper yes, six fi six figure turntable? Yes it is. And it's just been, it's just been upgraded with something I'd like to tell all of your uh everybody that's watching about. And I'm going okay. to show it to you. It's down here. You can see part of it down here. I hope it's Can you see yeah, I'm getting it low enough so you can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you see this thing here? Can you point to it? Yeah, my finger's on it now. Okay. You see, you see this thing bouncing up and down here? Okay, yeah. It's on, of course, I'm bound. And now, here's the here's the stand that it's on. You see this? Can you see it moving? Unfortunately, my my return video is not very good, so I'm not going to be able to follow oh, you as much as uh, those who are watching wait, the real how stream. About light? Pull the lighting guy in. <laughs> is this better or worse i think it's better okay you see this contraption here okay yep my finger is yep can you see everything moving up and down now look up here see the up here watch that okay that's the that's the platform is that the new thing yeah see it moving up and down web 2272 says i see it moving and a bunch Good. of other people okay. say yes yes that that's called a minus K platform, and this was invented. Uh, the, if you go to minus K dot com, you can see all, all about it. And this is a very brilliant guy that that uh, designed a um, this mechanism. It's completely passive, and it it basically isolates uh, to a half a hertz or below. And it doesn't use air, and it doesn't use a piezoelectric uh, any kind of um, reactive force. It's simply uses what's called uh it's like a bending spring technology that i i spoke to the guy that invented it yesterday but don't ask me to regurgitate it to you because he's brilliant and i'm not when it comes to this kind of scientific stuff okay but it's unbelievable and you can buy these uh for any size weight that you have and put your turntable on it or you can even put a DAC on it and apparently you can hear the difference it isolates have you, have you heard the difference on on your system on the turntable it's ridiculous it's yeah of hmm. course unbelievable okay so now i'm gonna play you uh see if this sounds familiar this is ernst korngold now yes hear all the noise the record makes 
<laughs> well, it's not like we're... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Alien 8 says, uh, uh, sounds like Superman. And S Surfer says, Star Wars rip, which, of course, Star they're both Wars, right. Star Wars, Superman, you know, you can hear you know, all, of, all those things. And what's interesting is it's not just, it's not just the, uh, the, the melody that's so similar, but the, arra- the way the, uh, the orchestra is arranged is, is, is incredibly close. But yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. And what we were hearing there over lo-fi Skype audio uh, was your uh, six-figure turntable playing through your very high-end um, uh, rest of your system? What what else is in your system that we were listening to? Well, I'm just starting to review. You know, I don't have a big room. You know, you can see this. I'm not ashamed of my not big room. This is what it is. It's not a big room. Right. But um, they just installed the. This is the most unlikely speaker that should ever fit in this room. These are in, these are um, Wilson XLFs. They're taller than me. They're they're enormous. You see how big they are. They cost yeah. two hundred. They cost two hundred thousand dollars. They're very expensive. Yeah. And I don't have a big room. I sit eight feet away from these speakers. And I, when I sit down, I'm going I'm to show you what, what the view looks like from where I'm sitting. Okay. Can you see that? Yep, look at that. So the tweeter is way above my head where I, from where I sit. Right, but it's and, angled and down. It's all yeah, it's all focused. It's all there's all in the back. All of these drivers can be can be moved to focus the picture towards where I'm sitting. So when I sit in this chair 8 feet away from them, the image sets up right in front of me where you'd expect it, not up where the speakers are. Mm. It's it's amazing how that works. By the so way, that, a lot of people in the chat room are, are really talking about, wow, you, you know, how can you afford speakers that, that expensive? Well, of course, you're reviewing them. So the manufacturer has uh, provided them for you to review. And unless you come up with the dough, they're going to come and take them away at some point. Right. I own, I mean, the speakers that I, that I own are, uh, are these, which are almost as big. These cost $65,000. Now, how can I afford this stuff? Well, I work, <laughs> you know, <I> work. <laughs> and, and uh, I've been working in this for quite some time and I get paid pretty well. You know, I mean, I, I do this, I, I review equipment as a job, you know, yeah, my column, yeah. my columns turn out to be very popular. And, and here's some other math you might consider. When I made my first DVD, I was hoping about turntable setup, which, you know, I, could, I uh, why don't I show that as long as I'm here? Right. Why don't you? Uh, and also, you should go to analogplanet.com and check out the site because we should talk about that. But here's well, of course. Here's my first here's my first DVD. Okay, this is this is actually I got to get better on the camera. It seems like, okay. This is uh, the first one. It's about setting up a turntable, and I figured, you know, I figured if I could sell a couple of thousand copies, I would break even because it cost me about twenty thousand dollars to produce, and I borrowed the money. And my wife was she was very supportive. She said to me when I told her I was going to do this, she said, I hope you don't lose the money. So uh, and uh, I made it and I have sold um, 14,000 of them, which is wow. and it still and it still sells every month. I sell 100 or 200. And so, you know, it wholesales for fifteen dollars. OK, that's what I, I don't sell them directly. I, I wholesale them. Uh-huh. So so do the math. You know, I can afford stuff. Yeah, (laughs) I think, and we were at the show in uh, in Newport Beach a couple of weeks, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah, and and one of the uh, we had an ask the editors panel, and one of the questioners said, um, asked all of us on the panel, "What equipment do you own?" 
And uh, the editor of another magazine, I won't mention, uh, said, I don't own anything. And I piped right in. And I said, I, I just I just I have a problem with that. I think if you are working in this industry, if you believe in this industry, you should have some skin in the game. You know, it's not as much yeah. fun as having in the game in porno, but it's still fun. And uh, <laughs> and um, so, you know, I started out with a modest system and I, I built it up and you get very good prices. You know, you get you get industry accommodations. And it's not the industry accommodations that some of the cynics say, which is, oh, yeah, Framer bought that turntable. He paid them a dollar. And so he can say he bought it. No, it's not like that. It's not that like that. No, I, I can tell you that for sure. I mean, yeah, I buy my stuff on industry accommodation as well. And it's, you know, less expensive than you can buy at retail. But it's still, you know, a significant amount of money on expensive stuff. Right. And that that turntable cost me as much as a nice car would cost. And right. uh, your I priorities are where they are. What's that? Your your priorities are right. you, can, you can you can live with a with a older car and and have these really not have this really nice turntable. I drive a Pinto, so um, <laughs> I have a nice car too. But um, so the the point is, I think you should own something if you're in this business, even if you can't afford the really expensive stuff that you become accustomed to reviewing. Own a modestly priced system, and then use that as a you know as a a, a benchmark for what the really expensive stuff sounds like. So you can decide whether it's a good value for people to own. Um, and over the years, as you, you buy and you sell and you trade, you can afford more. So now I own these max threes here that sell for 65,000 and I can sell those and, you know, recoup what I paid for them and probably more honestly, and, and maybe buy these things, but I'll have to borrow the money to, to own these things anyway. <laughs> We're on 20. Web 2017 in the chat room says, can the 65K system, those Max 3s, yeah. uh, beat, beat B&W? I don't know if, if this is a competition. Mm. You know, that, that's not what it's about. There, there are a lot of different speakers that are very, very good. They do different things and they, do, they, they have different tastes for different people. That's why I think when you review equipment, it's not about what you like. Who cares what I like? What I like really shouldn't matter to anybody. It's what you like that matters. And if I, tr if I can describe what it sounds like in a non-biased way uh, and you have an idea what it sounds like, you'll know whether it's something you might be interested in. My favorite emails are from people who say, I read that review. I could tell you really didn't like it, but based on how it sounded, how you're describing the sound, I think it's something I would like. That's the goal of a reviewer yeah. to me, not, not to give you... Um, <laughs> So a B and W speaker can be very, very good. Some of them are very, very good. A lot of people, you know, think Wilson speakers. I read some of the stupid stuff you read online. I don't go online for the most part and read the chat rooms because so much of it is so ridiculous. Oh, Wilson speakers are for the carriage trade. They're not for real music for music lovers. They're glorified PA speakers. This is such nonsense. I've met conductors and uh, soloists and orchestras who own Wilson speakers, and I guarantee you they're not part of the carriage trade and. They know what music's supposed to sound like, but other people have different tastes. And uh, some people like flat planar speakers. Some people like those single wizard clone speakers that sound like that. Uh, that I, <laughs> I don't understand. You know, well, it's if you play a shakuhachi, you know, a, a, a Japanese flute, man, they sound great. Or a female shakuhachi, voice, shakuhachi, which I actually whatever. do play it. Well, you, shakuhachi, shakuhachi, tomato, tomato, whatever. You know, right, right, right. You have to have an open mind about this and understand that. Every speaker sounds different. You walk it a room by room by room, and every speaker sounds different. So, what's the right sound? Well, there are not. There is no right sound. There the right sound is what you, what you want. What you want to hear, right? What any individual of, wants to hear, right? There are a lot of wrong sounds, though. There are a lot of things that just sound wrong, and they will measure wrong too. Then again, there are a lot of products that are measured, and uh, unfortunately, consumers don't understand the measurements well enough. I had. Uh, recently, I met two guys, two young Russian engineers at an, a turntable setup seminar that I did in, in New York at Stereo Exchange. And uh, they came up to me and they don't have a turntable, but they said, uh, we want to talk to you. Your room is boomy bass. Bass is boomy in your room. I said, no, it's not. But uh, we saw the measurement. Measurement show boomy bass. Uh, you got a very boomy, loud. I see the bump in the 40 hertz region. I said, look, the measurements tell you something. There's probably a little bit too much bass, a little bit too much bass. But if you came down to my room, you wouldn't hear it as such. You would just say, man, the system sounds great and, you, and you'd and like it. 
He said, but uh, I don't think, I think you're covering up. I said, come on down. I'll invite you over. They said, you'd invite us to your house? I said, yeah, come on down. So they came over. They brought their test CD and they sat down. First, they looked at where I sit and they looked at this tall speaker and they, um, and they were totally incredulous. And they put the CD on. One guy sat there and played his, he said, you're right. No boomy bass. Sounds great. Perfect. I don't hear a boomy bass. I said, you think I would sit here and listen to boomy bass? I, I this is my job. I got to sit here all day, whether I want to or not. Sometimes I don't <laughs> like boomy bass, but if you look at the measurement in, in, you know, in room measurement, you will see, uh, an excess of bass, a bump, but you don't hear it as such. Just like in the same measurement of these speakers, there is a, if you do an on-axis response, there is a dip in the, in the mid-range that you can see. Mm -hmm. And so there, some consumers only look at the on-axis response. That's the only, the rest of the waterfall curves, the other things, they don't understand them, so they ignore them. If you read carefully John Atkins' measurements, he says below the tweeter axis, it fills in. And guess what? The speaker is designed so that it's taller than where you're sitting. So it's designed to fill in below on axis response. And it does. And it sounds incredibly smooth. Hmm. So there's, there's a, a great example of the difference between measurements and what you're actually perceiving when you sit in the right place. That and plus the fact you have to take all the measurements and put them in your mind and try to arrange them in a way that makes sense to you sonically. But that's even harder than just listening. It's very difficult to take them all and proportion them correctly to decide which one is creating what I'm what I'm hearing. Um, Joachim Gerhard, who design, used to design audio physics speakers and now designs uh, Canali, Canalis speakers, uh, he once said to me, in today's measurement world, it's not difficult to design a speaker that has flat on-axis frequency response. But that doesn't mean it's going to sound any good because all of these other factors, off-axis power response and uh, many other factors are involved in what a speaker finally sounds like. Mm -hmm. So measurements are useful because if a speaker has absolutely horrible measurements, it you, probably will sound horrible. Uh, and if it's got really good measurements, the chances are it'll at least be competent. And uh, there are a lot of competent speakers. That, there's a lot of competent hi-fi out there right now, and generally. Uh, right. I think it's better. And people, who, the, the cynics who say, well, all that's happened in the audio industry is uh, it, the same stuff has been repackaged to look differently over the past 30 years, and it's all the same. They're, they're very wrong. They're completely, utterly clueless. I had um, Greg Calby down here, who masters at Sterling Sound, one of the, one of the great mastering engineers. Uh, he did the original mastering of Graceland. His name is all over some of the best recordings. Mm -hmm. And he came down here uh, to listen to Graceland on my system because they were preparing for a reissue that they've done that Roy Halley, the recording engineer who originally did it, oversaw. And it was cut at Sterling again, this time lacquer, whereas the first cut was DMM. And uh, he, I played him the record and he said that he heard things on the record played on my system that he did not hear on the tape when he mastered it originally. Wow. And that's, that's not to say that my turntable is better than the tape recorder. It's to say that the system that he had in the studio in 1986 did not have the same level of resolution as what I have down here now. Yeah, yeah. So, the uh, the seeker in the chat room asks uh, to ask me to ask you what you think of old school speakers like the Pioneer HPM 100s for mainly rock music listening. Have you heard those? I have not heard those. Uh, my feeling about old school, and this, this is a lot, this is kind of controversial, old school anything, uh, we have learned so much over the past 30 or 40 years about materials and there's new materials and new ways of measuring and uh, so much more sophistication is brought to this that I think uh, the older gear has a certain nostalgic quality that's great. I mean, I know they say this about vinyl. Oh, you, you have this nostalgia, you know, for you like vinyl because it's got this old crackly nostalgic sound. But I don't buy that for a minute. And I, anybody that would come down here and listen, they'd know that's complete nonsense. But um, old, old speakers and old uh, turntables that were designed before, a lot of things that we know we can measure now were measured and, and materials were in, uh, unable to be built. Uh, it, they, they just don't measure up to a lot of the new stuff. On the other hand, I will say that in the 1970s, uh, when turntable 
science and art was taken to a level that hasn't been seen since, with few exceptions like the turntable that's here, uh, you could get some of those uh, big Japanese uh, turntables made by um, uh, Kenwood and uh, Microsecchi and some of these other manufacturers that to make that kind of quality today would cost a quarter million dollars. So, and you can buy those on eBay for, you know, five or 8,000. It's a tremendous bargain. And those things are still incredibly good. But, uh, you know, you could put a Sirwin Vega speaker up from the 80s and, and rock out and it'll play loud and it'll play deep and, and it'll be a lot of fun. But you won't get the resolution and the detail and all the things that, that a new speaker can do. I mean, that's, I think it's pretty well proven that's the case. And there are people that will disagree with me on that, but um, that that's my opinion. All right. Right. Well, we got a bunch of questions and comments in the chat room, and there's a lot more stuff that I want to cover with you. But if you'll just allow me to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. Uh, Certainly certainly part of the new paradigm, not part of the old paradigm. Uh, But Netflix, of course, lets you stream thousands of uh, TV shows and movies directly to your TV through your TV itself. There are Netflix apps for most TVs these days as well as Blu-ray players, game consoles, dedicated streamer boxes, your computer, even your smartphone uh, and tablet computer. You can stream Netflix to any of them. And uh, you can even start on one device and finish on another, a particular program, if that's your fancy. Uh, All streamed immediately to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. Uh, And for our viewers and listeners here on the Twit Network, uh, Netflix is offering a 30-day a uh, free trial. All you have to do is go to netflix.com slash twit and start that 30-day free trial of streaming as much and as many uh, movies and TV shows as you like. And uh, once you start getting into the eight bucks a month, uh, you're still streaming as many as you like. And I must admit, uh, I find it a very convenient thing to do when looking for programs that uh, I might not have on disc, that might not even be on disc. Uh, but they are very likely to be there on Netflix, uh, which has a vast streaming library. So give it a try, netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit Network. So, uh, Michael, I wanted to ask you, when you started by saying that uh, John Atkinson, uh, in reply to your request to, to write a column about vinyl, uh, said, well, yeah, you can, tr- you can try, but it's going to disappear in a few years. Well, it hasn't. And, and that was quite a few years ago now. And in fact, vinyl, I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be gaining in popularity. Why do you suppose that is? They, they, will, they map the increase, and it's, been, it's significant. I mean, it's, it started out as a small number. So you, know, you could say, well, vinyl sales have doubled. If one record was selling and then you sold two, you've doubled your sales. <laughs> it but, doubled, yeah, exactly. But the numbers are, you know, in millions and millions of new records are being sold. And uh, forget about the used record market, which is still crazy, and there's still lots of expensive records that you can find and buy. The new vinyl market has, has really grown. In the last, it's totally unlikely. But I, I knew, I knew something was going to happen because uh, books are not going to go away because of uh, the iPad or the Kindle or those kinds of things. I like reading books on those on tablets too. When I travel, I, I'd rather read it that way. Uh, but there's still something about reading a book, you know, turning the pages. There's something about that, and there's something about I, I, I look at vinyl and I not for every, you know, I just assume download Darl's Barkley doing crazy. That's fine, and I do download some music, uh, but. For things that I treasure, there's something about having the physical thing just for that part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's the sound. And, you know, this is uh, a crazy thing. All all of this uh, recording is an art and a science and playback is an art and a science. And for whatever reason, there's something about uh, what a properly played record produces, this technology that the people who invented it and listen to it in the 40s and 50s, had no idea how good it was. They didn't know because they couldn't play it back properly as we, like we can now. And it keeps just getting better. There's something about what a record sounds like in terms of the difference between reality and it and the difference between reality and a, a, any digital form, in, in my opinion, from, from what I hear, that is just something magical about it. And if you, if you sit a person down and play them a CD and just observe them, 
in, in a few minutes, they, they, they're looking around. They're, this, they're not paying attention. You put a record on and they, you relax and you sit and you take it in and you can turn the lights out and spend hours just listening and doing nothing else, not, you know, and not multitasking. And why is that? Uh, I'm not sure, but I've, I've heard anecdotal evidence of people who have uh, autistic or, or, or severely um, compromised uh, mentally you know, children who, if they put a CD on, the kid just walks out of the room, they don't hear about it. Put a record on and they come in and they sit down and it gets them. And uh, mm. maybe this needs to be explored further, but... Um, it's anecdotal what you're, what you're saying here, but... Yeah, and there's something about it. And, you know, maybe when you measure it, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't measure as well a, a, as a CD, but it sounds better. It sounds more real. And uh, it used to be, I would say, you know, records sound better than CDs. And people would say, you're crazy. What's the matter with you? Now, you, you, you say it and people say, oh, I know. I know that. Because mm. they've heard it. And I, I've invited people in here all the time who are skeptical. And I say, all right, let's, whatever, you pick the music, whatever you want to hear. It'll be a 40-year-old record I'll play that I've owned for 40 years and played for 40 years. And you can play the newest, greatest CD mastering, even though the first mastering was perfect, because CDs are perfect, and let's listen to it. And they, uh, they inevitably you know, say, you're right. And then they go, oh, yeah, but your turntable costs $150,000 or whatever. I said, that's not really the issue. Uh, I can put a Project Debut 3 or the Project Carbon, which is a $400 turntable, and there are certain qualities about the analogness of it or whatever signal processing is going on in the process that create this sensation of a live performance happening in front of you that I, I never get from a digital format. And, you know, John Atkinson, my editor, is, he, you know, he records digitally and he's up, up to the latest science and he, I think he doesn't play records too many times. When he comes here, and I'll put her, I put on the, the reissue of Graceland for him a couple of weeks ago, and he was like, I've never heard that kind of a bass drum dynamic from a record before. How can that be? I said, because it's there. It's, you're hearing it. It's there. Then you put the CD version on, and it inevitably sounds just challenged. It's just, it's just not Flat. as good. Flat. Uh, bo bootleg, Craig, bootleg Craig in the chat room is asking uh, a related question here. You, mentioned, you did mention one. Um, I'm spending uh, money. What? Inexpensive turntable. He wants to know what what what's the least you can spend on a turntable to get to get really reasonable sound. If you get uh, a project debut carbon, which is their latest uh, inexpensive project, it's like four hundred dollars, and uh, even the cartridge that comes with it is pretty decent. But and upgrade the cartridge and get a decent phono preamp. I think you'll hear what can happen with a record. And I, I know that because I've gotten lots of emails from readers who said, you know what, I've been reading your column because I found it entertaining. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to go out and get one of these. I'll see, I'll, I'll challenge him. For 400 bucks, I can afford to be a sport. I can always sell it on eBay if I don't like it. And what, <laughs> ends, up happen, what ends up happening is I get, like I got this email from this, I got an email from a, a big Republican Party operative and I'm hardly in the Republican Party. And, uh, but we Although we're not going to talk politics on this show, no, just to, to make sure you understand that. Yes, but we, me and this guy communicate on the vinyl level. We stay away from politics. But he Good. said, "You're the," he said, "You're the devil and you're the angel," because he said, "I had uh, a, a record, a small record collection. Then I got stationed overseas. I sold my records. I got CDs. I converted them all to MP3s. I know that was wrong. And I went overseas, and that's what I listened to. Then I got back and I started rebuying all the CDs that I had sold." And then I said, you know, I used to really like records. I'm going to get a turntable. So I read, read your column and I bought an inexpensive turntable. And now you're the devil and you're the angel because now I've upgraded my turntable twice. I'm buying vinyl. I'm on a first name basis at Music Direct and Acoustic Sounds and all these different uh, vinyl websites. And I'm buying records like crazy and I'm addicted to it. And, and my, my uh, clients understand that between eight and nine in the morning, I'm having my coffee and listening to listening to vinyl and doing nothing else. And at night when I finish working, I do the same thing. I never did that with CDs and they understand that. And mm -hmm. that's what I hear from so many. I never get an email saying you're an idiot. I bought a turntable. You know, I, I took your debate and you're it's the worst thing I ever did. Never. Not once has that happened. Only the opposite has happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that I'm onto something. So <laughs> what about what about uh, 
uh, higher resolution than CD. I think you recently did a uh, some sort of test with 2496, that is 24-bit resolution, 96 yes. kilohertz sampling rate uh, right. audio, uh, as opposed to vinyl. Uh, what are what are your thoughts along those lines? Well, I have I have a Sulu's here that I use for my uh, digital music, and which I is download- a, which is by the way a digital music server to make sure everyone understands. Yes. Just say I'm not you know I'm I love records I'm but I'm not crazy I'm not a crazy person I, <laughs> I, I you know I, I so this is this this is the uh, they don't call it a Sulu's anymore it is now the Meridian digital music it's one of these names that you don't that's forgettable whereas Sulu's is rememberable but, but whatever right. Right. At any rate, you know, I'm really bad with this camera. I must be spatially challenged or something. But anyway, so I have that, and I download 9624 files from HD tracks, and I listen to them. And um, they sound much better than CDs and much more listenable. But somehow, when I put the record on, and I'm looking for uh, this new McCartney album, but I won't find it. But, you know, Paul McCartney's got a new record out called Kisses on the Bottom. Right. And uh, so... I downloaded it from HD Tracks, and it sounded wonderful. It was recorded mostly at Capitol uh, Studios and, and and engineered by Al Sh- Al Schmidt, who's one of the great engineers. In oh yeah, time. oh but, yeah. So you know, if you like Diana Krall and you like that production and you like that kind of sound, that's what this record is. Even though it's been misunderstood, and, and you could read the review that I wrote on uh, AnalogPlanet.com. Anyway, the, the file sounds great. Then I got the vinyl, and uh, Doug Sachs cut the vinyl probably from a digital file, but. For whatever reasons, when you listen to the record, it's more enjoyable. And I would bet Paul McCartney agrees because I know he's a vinyl guy. Mm-hmm. He's a vinyl guy. Roger Daltrey is a vinyl guy. Uh, Keith Richards is a vinyl guy. You know, but what do these guys know about music? What do they know about music? <laughs> what do they know about what the master tapes sound like? I love when I hear that kind of nonsense. Yeah. And, hey, uh, Leo's in Leo's in the chat room, and I I I hope it's it's our our uh, our. Uh, my certainly my inspiration leo laporte asks but how many uh, records even vinyl records are recorded in analog anymore that's true that is very true i believe that the mccartney album was recorded analog i believe because um uh, the jazz writer will friedwald was was writing about uh, the mccartney record and he interviewed paul and he said something about well when they stopped running rolling tape of course there's digital tape too so yes, but uh, and that's true, but for whatever reasons, and and again, it's it's a signal processing issue. Uh, you know, when when digital first came out, they started adding tubes back into the chain because the sound it was so cold and hard they wanted to warm it up somehow. So that was a form of signal processing to get to the end result, mm. and uh, because this is an art and a science, and for some reason, even records that were recorded digitally, let's say it was recorded at ninety six twenty four. And it came out on CD at 16-bit 44K, but the vinyl was cut from a 9624 file. Which do you think is going to sound better? I think if it's properly played back, uh, the record should sound better. Now, if you're cutting a record from a CD, it sound, you know obviously you're not really gaining to anything. You're probably losing. On the other hand, you still are signal processing. So ultimately, what counts is what it sounds like to you, which is more mm. accurate. They both are, you know, they're both signal processing. You, you take a 9624 file and turn it into a 16-bit CD, you're decimating it, you're processing it, and you're doing stuff to it. And then you're cutting a glass master, and then you know, you're know you stamping it, and then you're playing it back and having this little laser attempt to decide what's a, what's a, uh, a land surface and what's uh, a pit. Right. And of course, the irony about, about a CD is that it's really an analog format. It's an analog, a physical analog of a bitstream. Right? Right. Right. And so that's why... Uh, a lot of even digital people insist that when you take a CD and load it onto a server and play it back, spit out the data free of the mechanical playback process, it sounds better because there's less jitter and there's less error correction and whatever else. And again, uh, I'm not interested in the technical aspects of that. I'm interested in what it's, how it sounds. Mm-hmm, you know, there, mm-hmm. there, there was a uh, interesting uh, article, and I, I can't recall where it was, but uh, they took a bunch of recording engineers into a room and they played them a live mic feed. And then they played them uh, a, a PCM conversion at high resolution, and a digital and a, a DSD conversion. And then they played them. By the way, DSD DSD is the uh, bitstream for SACD, a very high resolution digital right. audio bitstream. 
Yes, I think it's 2.83 megahertz of one bit. Megahertz, and, but it's but yeah. it's one bit on and off very, very fast. Right. And then they played them an analog tape conversion of the same mic feed. And the engineers all said two interesting things. They said, first of all, they thought the high-resolution PCM and the DSD both sounded very close to the mic feed, almost transparent to the mic feed. But they preferred the analog tape playback because they said it sounded more like the live music. Because a microphone is, you know, it's a transducer and all microphones are colored, just like all speakers are colored. Sure. And for whatever reason, whatever the analog tape did, it, it made it sound more like live music. So, you know, you can take what you want from that. But to me, yeah. ultimately, it's, it's whatever sounds, whatever makes me sit in my room and, and listen to music and turn the lights out and say, wow, it's just like it's happening right in front of me. And well, I, gotta, I have to admit. I was just gonna. I was just gonna say that uh, I've recently been talking uh, with a number of people about the how we have gotten so far away from actually sitting down and listening to music. Music has become background. That's right. Uh, my wife. My wife's father, in fact, was a was a composer, and he did not allow music in the house as background music. Now, I think that's a little extreme, but uh, and, you know, and there are certainly places for background music, but. He wanted to encourage his kids to, if you're going to listen to music, you sit down and you listen to the music, like as if you're going to a live concert. And why is it? That's because the artist is putting all of his heart and soul into something to communicate something to you. And you can use that in two ways. You can sit and turn your own mind off and pay attention to every grain of what that artist is, is saying and playing and doing and what the people who are making the recording are trying to communicate to you. You can do that. Or you can be a parasite and use the energy that's coming at you and just do your own thing, you know. And that's, unfortunately, we've become a very parasitic society at this point. People do not let stop their minds from, I mean, you go to a live concert and people are actually on their cell phones. I mean, it's just disgusting. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's the great thing. I think kids are discovering this again. They put a record on and they sit and it it makes your mind turn off. It makes you become a vessel for what the artist is trying to get across to you. And they like that because they're in this world of texting and fast paced stuff, bombarding them every second. And if something can stop their mind from racing and, and allow something else, not just superficially in, but completely in, it's like you know, an acid trip for them. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully without, without the acid. Doing, doing, doing what my gen, 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 generation did, 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 did. You know, right, 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 right. Uh, there's a there's a quite a little discussion in the chat room about um, uh, converting analog to digital and whether or not that makes whether or not it makes a difference where in the chain it happens. One one person uh, wondered about uh, taking a vinyl record that maybe was even recorded with analog tape and has been analog all the way and then digitizing that. Do you lose the uh, the analogness? In, in that process? I would expect so. I can answer that question for you with, uh, with many people to back me up because I just did this experiment in Colorado for a week. I took uh, the reissue of Graceland, which is spectacular, by the way. If you have a turntable, I highly recommend it. It's better than the original pressing. It was pressed at RTI. Um, Roy Halley, the original engineer, who's also a vinyl fanatic, so what does he know? Uh, <laughs> he, su he supervised this reissue and he, he came to one of the demos that I did in Boulder. It was really thrilling because he's a great guy and, and I have the utmost respect. I mean, he engineered uh, Notorious Bird Brothers, uh, Homes of the Love and Spoonful, uh, Bob Dylan's Highway 61 Revisited, all of Simon and Garfunkel albums and Graceland. And, you know, that's that that quality speaks for itself. So I took the new version of Graceland. I played it back on my ridiculously expensive turntable and using my... Uh, Ypsilon Phono preamp, which is also shockingly expensive. Um, and I converted it using uh, what I think is at least among the best converters in the world, which is right down here behind all of these CDs, ironically. It's the uh, MSB. It's that one on the bottom there. It's the MSB A to D converter. And uh, many, many major studios use this to do their conversions of analog tape to, re to release both CDs and 9624 uh, files for download. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, Ted Jensen used it to do the Cat Stevens T for the Tillerman that you can find on uh, HD tracks. So it's a really good A to D converter. 
And I converted uh, a cut from Graceland as a file, and I brought it with me on my computer to these in-store events I did at Listen Up in uh, Denver, Boulder, and, um, and Colorado Springs, and also at another store in Fort Collins. And I brought the record, and I said, Let's, let me play for you this 9624 file that was done on the most impeccable A to D converter and uh, done on a crazy expensive analog front end. And let's compare it to live playback on whatever turntable hap- and phone or preamp happens to be in the store at the time. So we did this first at a store called the Audio Alternative in, uh, in uh, Fort Collins. And I have to say, if I lived anywhere near there, I would, it would be very bad because I'd spend every minute <laughs> in this store. <laughs> had, this guy, uh, Rick, has a collection of vinyl that makes, makes my collection, which is um, pretty ridiculous to start seeing what's going on there. You know, it's only part of it. It, it makes my collection look really small. Uh-huh. And we played it back uh, on a pair of a Vanderstein 7s with an audio research DAC and an audio research uh, phono preamp and a... No, it wasn't. I'm sorry. It was not an audio research phono preamp. It was a Lin, a Lin Sondek turntable with a built-in phono preamp. And we played the file. And uh, most of the people using an audio research uh, digital to analog converter, and most of the people there thought that the file sounded better. Uh, really? The, the 2496 file? Yes. And I, you know, from what I heard, it sounded better in a lot of ways because look at the front end. I mean, it's a ridiculously high quality front end and uh, it was more dynamic. It had more spaciousness. It was, it was just, it was a better presentation overall. And those speakers just rocked out. It was great. Uh, and then I played it in the other stores I was at with much more modest uh, digital to analog converters. And I, I don't want to mention any names because it's not, uh, but with a better table. And uh, in every one of those demonstrations, and that was like, in one store I did, like it was like every half an hour for four hours. You want to try that sometime? It's, it's, yeah. it's Everybody thought that the record sounded better. And I couldn't disagree with them. The record, in the ways that vinyl is better, uh, it was better. I heard on the digital, I heard more dynamics. I heard more detail. I heard a tighter bass and I heard it, it was better in a lot of ways. But it, but the converter was not of the kind of quality so that you heard that edginess, that 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 grainy edginess that drives some people crazy when they listen to digital. So it's you know it's it's uh, it, it depends what the what the playback gear is here. Using the DAC from uh, from MSB, which is it's the best DAC. It's ironic. I was telling uh, my handlers at uh, at the parent company. It's ironic. I got this DAC to play with. It costs a lot, a lot of money. I'm not, I'm not reviewing it. Someone else is reviewing it. But it's the first time I've really played um, a CD quality sound back in here. And I can say, you know, this is pretty good. It, 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 it didn't have that digital quality to it. I still think records sound much better, but it, but it was really, really good. It was shocking. Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm sad to say we've come to the end of our time and we've got another show coming up here. Um, hey, but there, there's so much to talk about. Will you come back? Yes, please go to analogplanet.com, look around. It's got all the re- music reviews from uh, musicangle.com that I wrote and other people wrote for over 10 years. So there's a lot of, co- it's a new site, but there's already a lot of content up there uh, from the from the old site. And I'm posting as much stuff as I can, new stuff as I go. So it's going to be about hardware and software and uh, answer people's questions and go into more detail about things that I can't do in the, in the column and stereo because there's not enough room. So. Right. Uh, and you do have a column on your on your website called Ask Mikey, so people can send you questions about all of this, and and right. you'll post them online and and share your uh, yes. nearly infinite knowledge of this subject uh, with uh, with anyone who cares to to take a look. Thanks so much for being on the show. It was my pleasure, Scott. Uh, and again, uh, make sure uh, I want to make sure that everyone knows that you all you have to do is go to analogplanet dot com to read all about uh, vinyl and and uh, vinyl records and the hardware used to play them and all of the stuff we've been talking about today. And we'll talk about again in a future show because uh, Michael is just such an interesting guy. Thanks so much. It's fun, you know. Playing records is fun. I do it every day for a job, but it's the most fun. It's the most fun I have. Which is sad. Love, That's the most fun I have. You know, you know, you you and I both have a job that we really happen to enjoy. So uh, we're very lucky in that regard. Yeah, and I think VH1 is coming here in 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 July, 
and they're going to shoot my room and talk to me and, and they're going to do a story about, uh, about, uh, I th- you know, you know, Gary Delabate from the Howard Stern show, Baba Booey is producing yeah. this show and I'm going to be part of it. It looks fantastic. Like. Well, we'll make sure to, uh, we'll make sure to publicize that. Um, okay. So thanks once again. Uh, we got to sign off. Um, I'm Scott Wilkinson. Of course, my home, my online home is hometheater.com. You can, uh, email me at scott at twit.tv and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be another colleague, Tyle Hertzens, the editor of innerfidelity.com, who asked to come on the show to give his perspective on the whole issue of measurement and subjective listening and blind testing and all that stuff that I talked about with Steve Guttenberg several weeks ago. Uh, Tile has a different perspective, so uh, this will be somewhat of a counterpoint to uh, Steve's appearance. And I wanted to talk to Michael about this, too, because I know he's got some strong opinions about it, but we'll just have to have him on again to talk about that. Uh, next week, of course, the show will go back to its regular time, Monday at 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 4.30 Eastern. Uh, in July, I think we'll be shifting to uh, 1 o'clock uh, p.m., but for now, we're still at 1.30, so I sure hope you will join me for that show. And uh, until then, geek out! <laughs>